If you've been with us, oh, see, I just came on. See, I told you I sound like that. You all have doubted me. That's why I can't ever tell, although that I just did right now. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, I'm, I'm just going to share one verse from Isaiah 9, 6. It's been a passage that we've been going through for the last four weeks in our study here at Advent. I'm going to start out with this one passage tonight. But before we do that, we're going to pray, and we're going to ask God to bless our time here together. Uh, this little sermonette will be short, so we can get back and celebrate uh, that our Lord has come finally at last as we celebrate that here this Advent. So let's go ahead and pray right now and ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Father, we thank you for this night. Father, that we get to stop, take a breath, to focus in on the reason of the season. Although we've been trying desperately hard for the last month, every time we sing a Christmas song, we put a present under the tree, we do some decorating, we, we make some goodies to the Lord, trying not to get caught up in Maybe the anxiety or the rushness of the season. Or sometimes, so Lord, in our lives, we have bad things that happen. And it seems, how can we celebrate or enjoy this time of peace in our lives, dear Lord? And it, it gets more like work instead of enjoyment to celebrate your birth. So, Father, right now, as we wrap up this last title in Isaiah 9, that which we started four weeks ago, Lord. Help us to focus in on you as our Prince of Peace, so that we may leave here full of the peace that you bring. For we pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So I'll need that tonight, don't we? So here's the verse that we've been talking about um, every week now for the last four weeks. Isaiah 9, 6. And again, if you are unfamiliar with this passage, this is from the prophet Isaiah written 700 years before the time of Christ, before his coming, to tell us of the coming of the Messiah and what would be his characteristics. What would you know him by? How would you recognize him? Here's the verse this evening. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This is God's word. So as we've been reviewing over the last four weeks, Jesus has been portraying, we've talked about the different titles that he would have. Not necessarily names, but they would show these characteristics of God. We started with Emmanuel from Isaiah 7, that God would be with us, finally in the flesh, which is what we celebrate now, the incarnation of the Christ. And in that, here are the things that he would do. Jason started us off with the wonderful counselor, how he'd be this great illuminator of our soul to show us in the darkness what is the light. As John said in John 1, he is the light of the world, and through him all things were made. Then Mike came the second week and talked to us about his almighty power. We talked about the events in Jesus' life, all the power that he could do things, which were to show us who he was, God in the flesh. But then just recently, uh, this past Sunday, we talked about the everlasting father, that Jesus is not God the Father. But it's one of the characteristics he portrays for us as a father to us all. Or I said that you would be, to help you remember, as he is a father of what? Forever, right? In the Scottish accent of Alistair Begg. And tonight we're going to wrap up quickly here what it is to be the Prince of Peace. But as I was praying today, I don't know if you caught it, uh, just so you notice this, Christmas isn't always peaceful, is it? Now, you might have things happen. The Aguileras are here tonight, Mama's home. So we thank God for that. It makes it kind of hectic right before the Christmas holidays. Oh, we got to go in the hospital and things happen, right? It's not always peaceful. Thing. Life happens, right? It keeps going. And tonight you're going to see that the Prince of Peace is not about him making everything right in your life. It's about him being right so that when bad things happen, you're okay with it. And so in that, just it's not always peaceful at this time of year. So I wonder, just along with the Aguilera, like, how's your holidays been? Think like right now. What's the past month been for you? What have you been experiencing some things are good, some things are bad. But here's what I want to remind us. If our peace is not found in God instead of Christmas memories, we won't make it through the year. Week one, I don't know if you remember me saying this, is that a lot of times we get caught up in Christmas and it could be even slightly depressing because we like Christmas to be like the big cherry on the end of our year. Do you remember me talking about that? And instead of viewing Christmas in a way that it's supposed to be this great event because it's supposed to make 2019 this big, great thing that you put the nice bow on, instead it should be for us 
as we end the year, a way to get us focused to look at 2020 as we work out of God's rest, to celebrate his coming, looking at the new year, knowing that he's going to go with us. That's what Christmas is supposed to be for us, this gift so that I may live for him, right? He's lived for us. We, we now can live for him. So we need something a little stronger than a yearly dose to cheer us up, right? A little dose of cheer to help us get through the year. We need something a little bit stronger than that for us. The first Christmas, though, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit with the story, as Jason, thanks for reading from that tonight, was anything but peaceful for our young parents that had the task of bringing the Christ into the world. Here's the Christmas encounter. I'm going to read one more time the Christmas event here from Luke 2. It's not going to be on the screen. If you want to turn to it in your Bibles, I'm just going to read Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. Here we go again. That was coffee. That was not in the Bible. Okay. So in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was the governor of Syria and all went to be registered each to his own town. That's in case you're not familiar with the Christmas story. That is the Roman emperor at the time wants everybody to be taxed and also to take account of the empire. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because it was the house and lineage of David, King David to be specific, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the Hotel Six. Right? They didn't leave a light on for Mary at this point in time because it was crowded. It was tax season, right? You all, some of you know that one too, right? That's coming for you. That's why you need some peace now. But in this, here's some of the things that were going on just to bring them into present line for us. Number one, why this wasn't exactly a peaceful event. Mar Mary's found out, remember this? We, we studied this in Luke 2 last year this time, like a long time ago, that she's pregnant. Now, in her day and age, as a 14, 15-year-old girl, possibly even younger, she's pregnant um, she is betrothed to Joseph, but this is not Joseph's child. And no one's saying it is. Do you know back in that day and age for this young lady, this, this was almost, this was life-threatening because her town, if they chose so by the law, could stone her to death. Merry Christmas. This is not peaceful, is it? This is a lot of pressure for this young woman. Joseph in Matthew, according to 119, was going to divorce Mary quietly to save her life yet that meant for him this shame of this woman why would she do this for me to me and how can i save her life and i'm going to go and start over again it's not peaceful for him either is it it's a lot of concern on his life we also find that though he married her anyways as you see in the text he took her with him facing the shame of his community, or even maybe they accused him of sleeping with her before their time was to be wed. He took that on himself. That's not peaceful. That's not rest, is it? They traveled. Now, ladies, you all going to kind of commiserate right here. They traveled hundreds of miles by donkey back, right? In her third trimester. How many of y'all want to do that one? I can't even stand being around you, some of you in your third trimester. I can imagine you riding on a donkey for hundreds of miles in the desert and it being nice, right? This is not a good trip for Joseph, right? At the end of this, he's like, Lord, I, should, I don't know why I'm here, right? This is not good. Um, in that, when they got to the town, because there was no room at the end, they had to stay in an unsanitary, no turn down service, no hospital room, right? No... Uh, no drugs, no epidurals, no nurses, no doctors, no even hot water, maybe not, and gave birth in that environment. That's not peaceful. How many of you all would have stressed out about that one? No, and even ladies, I know that some of us, our tradition is to give birth in our homes with our friends. She had no friends there. It's her new husband that hasn't even touched her yet, and he's the one that has to help deliver. This is not peaceful. And in that, after that, some shepherds were there. They gave witness to what was happening. We read about that. You're saying about that. And then that the wise men came and they warned them about what else was going to happen because King Herod, being afraid for his lineage, was sending in an army to wipe out all the babies in Bethlehem. 
and the angel of God warned them, and they left and went to Egypt. This is not peaceful, is it? Are you getting, the first Christmas, which may be an example to us, was not peaceful. So where, why do we build up in our head that Christmas has to be this time of peace? And, and in that, why do we make it so, such a physical, worldly peace? Because it was not that way for Jesus' earthly parents. Why do we feel like we're owed that? Because I think that's what our problem is, is when we don't get it, we get upset with it, don't we? So this first Christmas was not a peaceful time on earth. And yet, wasn't this baby carrying the title, the Prince of Peace? I don't think that's what he brought to Mary and Joseph, do you? Where was the peace that he was supposed to bring? I, I bet even now... We could discover with an investigation, if I was to walk around the room, if you were brutally honest with me, that many of us, God's elect in this room, that you're not experiencing the peace of Christmas right now, are you? Don't raise your hand. Sometimes being a Christian is, uh, is hectic, especially because it has the ability to make someone feel even more miserable. Did you know that? Now, that do you know that's what the world thinks, that sometimes Christians are the most miserable people that they know? It's because our views of life have not changed yet. Our world philosophy has not changed yet. How we view things, we think it should be easy. Because sometimes, a lot of times, here's what we're thinking, especially in this season, ready? Where is God in this, right? Or, why am I not resting in peace, especially this time of year? Or, why is life so hard? And Christmas time is a lot of times where you start asking those questions. Again, because you want it to be the cherry on the year instead of the peace living into the next year. And celebrating what has really happened. So many of us in this room thought life would get easier when we came to Christ. Many of us have been discouraged because this faith has not worked out for us the way we thought it would. But, but there are some of you that have discovered how Jesus really is the Prince of Peace. Even though life doesn't work out the way you want it to. And by the way, if that is you in this room, here's the calling of you in the church. You're supposed to teach the rest of us. You are not supposed to keep that a secret. So if you know that, help us all to believe in that. And you've discovered what it meant when Jesus said these words, and we're going to go through this verse in a minute, in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. That was coming from the man on the night of his death. But he had peace. So here's the question. What does the title actually mean? The title in the Hebrew is Sar Shalom. What does that mean? Well, the first part of the word, sar, means the one in charge, the big boss man. And actually, it's almost like a regal, yet it's combined with a military term. If you want to know, it is one of the terms that the Romans used to make the word Caesar. A Caesar was a five-star general that was given all the control of the empire to go wage war. Jesus is the sar. He is in control of how we face the world. That's his job, by the way, not yours. What's the second word? Shalom. It just basically means rest or tranquility or wholeness or completeness. It is the shalom that God brings us. So in our vernacular, this doesn't really translate well when you put these two words. We don't have a title like this, the star shalom. But Jesus, as the Messiah, the coming king, is the one that controls the peace that you receive in a world that is at war with God. That is what he's bringing to you. We are in wartime. So, quite literally, he brings wartime peace. That's what his title means. Some of you have even lived through a time where during World War II or Korea, you still remember the days living in America while America was at war, you had some wartime peace. Many of us children of the 70s and 80s, the Cold War era. But we were still had wartime peace. You can have peace in times of war. But for tonight, it means that when we are in a right relationship with God, He makes all things well with our soul. So does this mean, let me ask you this question tonight, does this mean that we can do whatever we want and receive this peace? If Jesus really is this for you, if you call yourself a, quish, a Christian, does this mean you can really have peace like this at any time you want? Some of us have had the year, right? And you know this, maybe this past year, if this has been you, maybe you had your, maybe with your spouse or with another loved one, you've 
talk down to your spouse in front of your children. By the way, parents, because I know we have so many parents in here, that's one of the hardest things to recuperate from in the year is to build up that spouse again in the eyes of your child. Maybe that's kind of been your year. Or possibly, maybe you've been in the wrong type of relationship this year, whether that's romantic or maybe it's a work relationship or maybe it's a friendship that's dragged you down, right? Because you went looking for peace and what somebody, how they could build you up. Possibly it could have been a money at matter this year. Maybe you went looking for peace and what it could buy you, but you didn't give a lot of thought to long-term right relationship with how that's going to pan out for you. And it was short time peace is what you were looking for. We're always stepping into things in our lives that we think will bring us peace, only to find out that these attempts have brought us more anxiety and regret, which is why we get to the end of the year and you want Jesus just to make it all better, right? I do that. But our attempts to find peace are fueled by fleshly desires. That's called temporary distractions in our world. And just like a drug addiction, these attempts of peace with worldly things are destructive, though. But, now this is all we get to Christmas, but the good news of the gospel is that it's never too late to come back under the Sar Shalom. Because see, in order for Jesus to have a title of the Prince of Peace in your life, in order for him to be the Sar Shalom, you have to do something. Do you know what that is? You have to subjugate yourself to his rule. At some point in your life, all of us, have to step under his title of Sar Shalom, and you have to start admitting, I can't bring peace to myself, but my ruler must bring peace to me. Is that where you're at tonight? That's the only way you ever get peace, by the way. So I just want to speak tonight on two different ways that the Sar Shalom brings peace to you, then we'll be done with this. Just two ways tonight. So here's the first one. The Sar Shalom is a peace that comforts you. The Sar Shalom is peace who comforts you. That's what you can expect from him in life. Let's go back to this verse again this morning. Or excuse me, this evening. John 14, 27 says this. Peace I leave with you and what my what? My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, troubled neither let them be afraid. Again, this is on the night of his being arrested for the cross. Right before this, he had told his disciples he was leaving him, and I would send you the Spirit, and don't be afraid of that. Have peace. Come underneath what I am called to do. The world offers, and it gives us ways to cope with what we're going through, but no matter how hard it tries, nothing it gives us permanent is what Jesus gives to us. Jesus, according to these verses, gives us a way to increase in joy, even in the midst of turmoil, permanently. You should talk to the Aldersons about what kind of two months they've had. This is what we want in our lives. Jesus' joy was made complete after his crucifixion because his resurrection proved that the Father was worthy of a life of obedience. And according to John here in John 14, 26, Jesus is offering us the ability to do the same by sending us the Helper, the Holy Spirit. So in 2020, you may be facing a cross of your own. I don't know what it is this year, and I'm just going to, before we even get to the new year, right? You're like, you're jumping way too fast, Jody. Like, I, I know that some of you are going to look at 2020, and you're going to want to have peace, or you're going to want to have a better year than you did in 2019. And the peace that Jesus brings is the one who comforts us. Do you know what that means? It means that you necessarily won't have challenges, but he's willing to walk through them with you. And are you ready for that person? Because it means that you have to come under the Sar Shalom. And stop trying to do it temporarily or in the flesh or in the worldly means. Whatever that means for you this year. This fact may make you a little nervous today because God has foreseen your day of trial. And he has a promise for you. Listen to Philippians 4, 6-7. As Paul was telling this to the Philippians, he says in verse 6, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus as your star, Shalom. 
So the Philippians are facing a world of struggle in their, in their days. And Paul recognizes that they are going to be facing trial and persecution by the same folks that put him in prison while he was writing this letter. So from this firsthand experience on how you deal with torture is to present your struggles to God to find your peace. Listen, here's 2020. You ready? When you hit the wall, get on your knees and pray. Did you all hear me? Someone say amen. Let's stop resulting in going to our money to find peace, a shopping spree, a Facebook binge, watching Netflix all night, eating what I want. Have I covered everything yet? All right, you want me to keep going? Say, preach it, Jody. All right, like, like how about we hit our knees and pray? In five minutes of prayer, will do more for you than a gallon of ice cream. It ever will. Trust me. And you finally get to lose that weight you want in the new year. But this shalom of God is guarding our hearts from despairing and giving up. Paul developed this talent for when he was weak, God was strong, he discovered, did he not? That through God's peace, he's able to endure more than what the Romans could throw at him. I found this great quote. Again, I'm going to reference, some of you bought this book on, on Keller's book on prayer. This quote's in there. Listen to this quote by Ol Halsby. Listen to this. Prayer and helplessness are inseparable. Only he who is helpless can truly pray. Do you realize yet that you are helpless with this world? Do you want to be underneath the Sar Shalom? Or are you ready to do it on your own? Understanding your helplessness is not a cause to fear, though. Like my family. Admittance is the first step over it. But it's a cause to rejoice because you have someone you can go to who is able not just to answer your prayers, if he so wills it, but is able to give you peace to abide in the trial. Let's just remember the good old saying in church, God is good what? All the time. And all the time? Amen, right? The Sar Shalom is the peace. He's the peace who comforts you. And here's your second point and last point this morning, this not evening. He is the peace who saves you. He's the peace who saves you. Romans 5.1 reads like this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, amen, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He saves us by faith alone. This verse doesn't say we've been justified, made right by our own good works in front of God. Not you trying to earn peace. It's that Christ has got it for you. Not by how much we sacrifice for him by denying our wants. We've been made right with God by our faith in him. Amen. Because of this, I am now at peace. You are now at peace. Because you believe means you have peace. That's what it says. And this peace, yes, it saves you, but it brings you something else. Yes, it saves you, number one, most satisfactorily. You need this in your life, but it also brings you something else. Ephesians 2 in verse 13 says this. But now in Christ Jesus, Paul says, you who once were far off have been not brought near by the blood of Christ. Here's the Christmas story right there, isn't it? Right. For he himself is our what? Peace who has made us both one. These two things right here we're going to hit on real quick and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now, what are these two things? So he brings us salvation by faith, this peace. But what else does he bring us? Well, he brings two parts here. He saves us to bring us into family. Family. Here's what I mean by that. In verse 14, we see that Jesus' sacrifice as our Sar Shalom coming underneath him, allowing him to do the work. He does the work, and here's what he's doing for us. He makes us one people. He makes the Gentile and the Jew the same family. He brings people together, those that have faith in him, under one roof so that we may remind each other of the peace that we've already found. Secondly, second thing, what does he do here? We see this peace has demolished a wall of hostility. Now, what's that about? A wall. It's made up of two things. Our angry rebellion against God. In his righteous will, because we want to do it our way. We want peace our way. And the other part is that God, as we talked about on Sunday, is a just God, a perfectly just God. And wrath. 
against sin. So Jesus, this wall is demolished by him to make peace between us and the Father. So that any time in our lives when we come against the world, we can believe, that means have faith, that God truly is with us, Emmanuel. So in 2020, here's my question for us as we close. Will you run to him with your anxieties and cares? Think about it. Now just stop right there for a minute. Seriously. Will you all take time tomorrow sometime after you open Christmas gifts, before your dinners? Will you commit to getting on your knees and praying when the anxieties and the worries come for you instead of trying to do it yourself and save yourself a lot of heartache? Will you receive forgiveness of your sins and will you receive his peace tonight? Celebrate the remainder of this week that peace has come for you, not in what you have found under the tree, but in the life of Jesus Christ alone. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your gift of peace tonight. As we sing to you, we celebrate in you. Help us to remember and celebrate how you brought us peace. It was through your son. I pray for my friends in here tonight, dear Lord, who may not know you who maybe have never understood this peace. It's kind of alien to them. How can they have peace in this world in in this way? Father, would you show them this year in 2020 that peace is able to have in their lives through the, the work of the Son. Father, I pray for, you know what, Lord, I pray for all my, our children in this room, dear Lord. I pray that this is a year for many of us where your peace comes home to them in their hearts, that they will celebrate you as a changed individual, that you would show your people that you are working in the lives of everybody in this church. So we celebrate you, and we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Sar Shalom. Amen.